When the sun sets on a night with no moon, if you are fortunate enough to be somewhere far beyond city lights, the sky transforms from its beautiful daytime cerulean into a window to the cosmos above. And on such nights, astronomers and astrophotographers open up observatory doors, prepare tripods and piers, arm guiding systems, and prepare for the long choreography of capturing light from the far side of the cosmos. Modern technology has increased our capacity to do this and do this well so much that one could ask these days, are we capturing that light for science or for art? And as we'll discover in this video, sometimes the boundary between the two can be hard to define. I remember when I was just a student going through my grad studies, occasionally one of my professors and I would find ourselves caught up in some good natured arguing over whether or not science, at least science as I often presented it, was science or art. She would often tell me, your reports don't have to be written so elegantly. You don't have to be the Carl Sagan of your field. And I would reply that looking for a difference between art and science was superfluous. Because if science can be described as a way of opening our eyes to truth, then art must be its reflection. I don't think we ever saw quite eye to eye on this. Though she did concede that there is elegance in revelation, and what better path to revelation than opening our eyes to the cosmos above? And that is exactly what we, as astrophotographers, do, whether or not we combine that with a complementary field such as astronomy. Ultimately, astrophotography turns our minds toward the cosmos, a cosmos that we must photograph without any control over lights or conditions or the unimaginable distances between ourselves and our subjects. All that we can control is the orientation of our telescope, which frequencies of light we will aim to capture from one moment to the next, and how long we image it for. And in that sense, astrophotography is one of the purest forms of cataloging the universe. As both science and art, it is the crystal clear gaze upon the cosmos above. And in that very real sense, the science and art of astrophotography are tangled. I think the process of astrophotography, as it contributes to science, is to capture as much information as possible, as accurately as possible. That aspect is all about technical mastery. But if astrophotography is also art, then what makes it art? While whether astrophotography is science or art are often the intertwined questions, I believe the first thing that defines the answer to the question is intention. When an astronomical object is being imaged for scientific purposes, the intention is to reveal truth, often truth that cannot otherwise be seen. <laughs> no, that can't be right. That's really very similar to artistic intention, isn't it? To look at things in a different way and reveal truths not readily apparent. To define the difference between astrophotography as art versus science, we have to look a little deeper, perhaps at motivation. For a scientist, the motivation is the revelation of information for an artist, the motivation is the revelation of beauty. A case in point, here's an image I shot of the Eagle Nebula, also known as the Star Queen Nebula. This image was shot using LRGB filters from the dark sky sites where the Sky Story Observatory is, and represents about 18 hours of total integration. One of the advantages of LRGB filters is they allow you to see the true color of an image. Now I know color is a somewhat subjective term, our eyes and brains all interpret color a little bit differently, but however differently our eyes and brains interpret them, the occipital lobe of our brain interprets those colors roughly through the channels red, green, and blue, which is why when we shoot color, we use red, green, and blue filters. Even modern so-called color cameras just have monochrome sensors using red, green, and blue filters that are permanently affixed to those sensors in the form of bare layers. But that is a very technical topic for another video. When I shot this image, I wanted to capture everything possible that was there. So this image reveals as much as possible of the dark nebulae, the dust structures, the stars and their reflections on the dust and nebulosity, and above all, the dramatic pillars of creation at the very center of the image. Color was only minimally adjusted by way of a little saturation enhancement and a little reduction of the green channel to help the natural blue stand out in the very center of the image. And while I personally feel this image is beautiful, one could also say this image is scientifically accurate. But after I shot this image, I looked at it and thought, 
There's so much information in this image, so many subjects, such as the partial wheel-like structure in the upper right, the dark dust structure that looks like a frozen lightning bolt on the lower right, and the ripples of red and blue down in the lower left. There was too much activity in the image, it drew the eye away from the main and secondary subjects, the extraordinary pillars of creation at the very center, the dragon in the tower just to its left, and the inverse pyramid above. So I gave some thought to how to recompose this image in a way that would remain true to the information, but draw the eye into all the activity at the core of the image, and I decided to use negative space. Negative space is the empty area around and between the subject of interest. It can naturally exist, or it can be put there by design, and it's often used by artists as a composition tool. The question is, how to put negative space into this image in a way that looks natural, Sure, I could create a mask and paint out the parts of the image that I didn't want to be in there, but it's very hard to paint a mask onto an astrophoto in a way that doesn't look artificial. But there was a way to do this, the magic of compositing. Using Affinity Photo, now just known as Affinity, I did a luminance based division of the information. This split the image into two pieces, the darker outer regions and the brighter inner regions. Then I put the information back together using a dark based compositing mode. This method intensifies the darkness of dark areas while leaving bright areas untouched. And the outcome was this, a rendition of the pillars, the dragon in the tower, and the inverse pyramid, wherein the negative space is the result of the natural difference in luminosity between the inner and the outer regions of the Eagle Nebula. I decided to leave out the stars because I really wanted to draw the eye to the intricacies of the pillars of creation and the amazing surrounding color. And sometimes, much brighter stars can detract from both the side of structure and color. It felt like I was looking at this amazing region as through a cave, so I dubbed this image the Cavern of the Pillars of Creation, and even made a frame print of this image for my wall. This image, I think, exemplifies intent for art. Were you to look at the Eagle Nebula through a telescope, you would see this image, and were you to photograph the region, over time, the image would look more or less, more and more like this. So, one could say this is the scientifically accurate version, but the Cavern of the Pillars of Creation is the artistic rendition of it. And the motivation for the creation of this image was to draw the eye toward the central structures, and there, reveal the intricacy of their complexity and their color. And therefore, while still remaining true to the subject, this astrophoto is a work of art. Astrophotography also becomes art by way of choices and processing and techniques. Over the years that I have produced the Sky Story channel, I've made use of and even created a few techniques that astrophotographers can benefit from in image development. For example, I revived an old image development technique called the Orton Effect, a technique that comes to us from long before digital photography all the way back in the 80s. The Orton Effect was used to enhance detail and color while giving a dreamlike effect to images. I also introduced many of the astrophotography community to the benefits of frequency separation in the development of astrophotography. Frequency separation allows for the division of color, light and shadow, and detail within an image. And this allows astrophotographers the freedom to process that information that push for the maximum revelation of the information contained therein. And for those with an artistic bent, frequency separation gave a wider latitude for the interpretation of information and there are countless other shooting and development techniques which can be used to develop information for scientific or artistic purposes. These include selection tools, color management, light and shadow development, selective muting of unwanted artifacts through techniques such as reflection compositing, and this doesn't even include all the skill required to actually shoot the astrophotography, including everything from polar alignments of a mount to choices on filters for management of everything from light pollution to the capturing of detail. I can say in truth that the technical aspects of astrophotography are an in-depth topic which we could explore for years. But let's turn the page. Artistic interpretation is yet another way that astrophotography becomes an art. In terms of our subjects, almost nothing is in our control. We astrophotographers are entirely subject to the whims of the weather, and we have no way to control the light on our subjects. They're either bright or dim, depending on their physical characteristics. And our subjects can even experience occasional phenomena that are entirely beyond our control, such as the appearance of a meteor or satellite in an image, or for that matter, a supernova. But an artistic element that is in the control of astrophotographers is composition. 
In other words, we can determine where we are going to place our subjects of interest within the frame. And, especially if you are shooting at high focal length like I typically do, you can select which parts of large subjects of interest that you want to reveal. In fact, some of my very best images have resulted from such choices in composition. The image you have been looking at, for example, is a portion of the Andromeda Galaxy that I shot over five nights. Using a combination of LRGB filters and the HAN03 filters, and shooting at 1280 millimeters, my intent was to close in on the Andromeda Galaxy and reveal the complexities of the dust structures and nebulae closest to us. Complexities that are often overlooked because this amazing but large deep sky object is often shot with low focal length. But my most favorite image of this year was a composition derived of a single tiny region of the huge and majestic Sol Nebula, a composition I call the Denser in the Soul. This image reveals one tiny, especially busy region of the Sol Nebula, where a central vein of nebulous particles comes together with the outer boundary of the nebula. Several nights worth of integration with the Wide Aperture High Focal Length Telescope and shooting an LRGB revealed not only the amazing true colors of this nebula, but several amazing and complex structures along with the complicated flows of the dust and gases of the nebula. And I have to admit, I've been thinking about doubling the focal length and closing on to this object up here, since it looks like it would make an especially interesting study. In the two years since I built the Sky Story Observatory and started the channel, so many of you have asked if I have prints available. I sincerely appreciate your enthusiasm for my astrophotography and the work of the channel. And I've chosen for the very first print that I'm going to make available, my personal favorite from this year. This image was, for me, a happy accident. I started shooting it just as a way to pass time while I was waiting for another DSO to come into position. And it just turned out to be spectacular. This is a high focal length image of a small region within the Sol Nebula. In this spectacular image taken by NASA's Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, we see the Sol Nebula down here on the lower left. And this image, taken with my schmidt cassegrain telescope from the Sky Story Observatory, homes in on this tiny region right down here. This is an extraordinarily active region of nebulosity, where it appears like a river of dust and gas is flowing between the nebula. There is an ionized region of star formation down here, in this area that I've come to call the dumbbell, and a crest-like dual wave expanding out in either direction above, setting the stage and creating a spotlight for the shadowy dancer up here. So much is happening here, star formation, flows of ionized gas, and icy clouds of dust, likely organic matter. It is a busy and fascinating region of the sky, and a fairly unique print too, because usually when people image the Sol Nebula, they're often shooting it with its companion nebula nearby, in low focal length, which gives a spectacular broad view, but misses all that amazing fine detail, which can only be really seen and appreciated at high focal length exemplifying one of the reasons I like shooting at high focal length so much. This image was also shot in LRGB, so the colors that you're seeing are very close to what the human eye would actually see. I call this image the Denser in the Soul. This will be a signed limited edition run of 250 prints. You have your choice of 13 by 13 square following my camera's original format, or cropped to a 2 by 3 format at 13 inches by 19 inches. The images are $59.95 Canadian, including shipping and handling to continental North America and the UK. And these images are, of course, available to the rest of the world. And all funds raised go toward the running of the observatory and the production of the Sky Story channel. So, if you like my images and you've always wanted to print, and you appreciate the educational work of the Sky Story channel, this is your chance to support both. The key takeaway, however, is that selecting what we're going to shoot, where we're going to shoot it, how we're going to compose the objects within the frame, and even the angle at which the objects appear within the frame, is the prerogative of the astrophotographer's choices in composition. And one of the very important choices that make astrophotography not just a science, but also an art form. In the end, astrophotography is a science, but it's also an art. And which it is really depends upon the prerogative of the astrophotographer who's doing the imaging. And, even then, whether or not an astrophoto is art or science is often a subjective matter. As I say this, my mind harkens back to this wonderful accident from the Hubble telescope. Yes, this image was an accident. It was intentionally shot, of course. But I remember reading the story of the person who created the image. 
He was experimenting with color schemes and his primary goal was to reveal the structure within it. He was applying different colors to the hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen information within it and stumbled upon this wonderful combination, what we now commonly know as the Hubble palette. A false color scheme where sulfur is assigned the color red, hydrogen is assigned the color green, and oxygen is assigned the color blue. And when he saw the output, he was bedazzled. And this serendipitous image, this happy accident, became one of the most famous astrophotography images of all time, an image created for the purpose of science that in itself turned out to be beautiful. And maybe there's an important takeaway here. Science and art will inevitably always be entangled. We humans share such a powerful desire for understanding that we fall in love with truth, and therefore we find it very hard to distinguish between science and art. And so the best art reflects truth in a way that is akin to the way the best science reflects beauty. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this somewhat philosophical video. Now, get out there and shoot that sky.